This presentation examines the paired t-test that we use for dependent samples. If we have the same subject measured twice, then we're looking at dependence. Well, why is that? If you have a pretest and a post-test, if a student does very well on the pretest, chances are that student will do very well on the post-test. So we can predict the likelihood of the second event because we know something about the first event. In that case, we conclude that those are dependent. And if we have dependence, what do we do with the data? Rather than looking at the numbers themselves, we look at how much improvement the individuals had. So we look at differences. If the scores went up or if the scores went down, we analyze those. So here's some data that we have. We have 33 randomly selected mathematics students. We have their scores on test one and their scores on test two, as well as the differences. You'll notice test one is 69, test two is 76 for a difference of seven. Test, two is, test 1 is 77, test 2 is 64 for a difference of negative 13, it went down. So if we're going to ask Minitab to do this for us, we would say let C3 equal C2 minus C1. 76 minus 69 is 7, 64 minus 77 is negative 13, etc. And here's a few more data points. So you'll notice you have a total of 33 elements in our data set that will be important for us as we move forward. We need to decide when it's fair to use the paired t-test, and that's the same as it was for the regular t-test, namely the conditions for the central limit theorem had to be satisfied. So what did we need there? We would need one of the following to be true. So either the number of differences had to be large, large typically was defined as greater than or equal to 30, or the data set had to come from an underlying normal distribution. Be careful with this one. Oftentimes the underlying data set is not normal, so when you have a small number of differences, oftentimes it is not fair to use the t-test. So we need to establish our null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. We want to determine whether or not student performance on average for the entire population has improved from test one to test two. And improvement is defined as test two minus test one. So look at the averages of all those differences. Our question is, is that average significantly greater than zero? So our H naught will be mu sub d equals zero. That's the mean of the differences for the entire population equals zero versus the mean of the differences for the entire population is greater than zero. If that's the case, then we conclude that there was some significant improvement. So here's the numbers that we have. Our statistics, we had 33 numbers, 33 differences. The average of those differences was 0.6364, and the standard deviation of those differences was 9.611. We're going to compute our test statistic. X bar will be 0.6364, mu will be 0, S will be 9.611, and N will be 33. And plugging those numbers in, we get a test statistic of 0 0.38, which is a very small test statistic. So we're going to be shading to the right of the test statistic, and we'll have to see how much area we have there, but we're not feeling too good about our chances because the test statistic is so small. So again, there's our information. We need our degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are n minus 1, n is 33, 33 minus 1 is 32. So we have a t distribution with 32 degrees of freedom. And the test statistic t is 0 0.38. I'm going to shade everything to the right. Remember, 0 is the middle of the distribution, so I'm exaggerating 0.38's position. It's actually much closer to 0. But this area is what we're looking for. So we ask Minitab, CDF 0 0.38 semicolon T32, and what does Minitab give us? Minitab tells us that that is 0.646772. So this is about 65% of the area. So how much is to the right? The p-value is the area to the right. Again, the alternate hypothesis is mu sub d is greater than zero. We shade to the right of the test statistic. What do we get? We get 0.3532, very, very large p-value. So the p-value is 0.3532. Since it's large, our conclusion is fail to reject H0. And that's not typically what the researcher wants. If you fail to reject H0, you're not going to be able to get the results you're interested in, namely showing the improvement. So we say there is insufficient evidence to conclude 
that students improved their performance from test one to test two. If we had looked at the entire population, it's possible that our conclusion would have been no improvement, that the average for the first test and the average for the second test, the increase would have been negligible. Okay, here's another example we're going to look at. We're going to say 10 people are tested in their time needed to run a mile. These people will then participate in a 16-week training session. At the end of the training session, they're given the same test. They will run the mile one more time. And we want to determine if the training session was effective. Well, it will be effective if their times decrease. So does the amount of time it takes them to run the mile go down after we complete this session? So if we do post-test minus pre-test this time, we will be looking for negative numbers. So we have some data to look at. Pre-tests, we have 10 participants, numbered 1 through 10. The first participant ran the mile in 5 minutes and 30 seconds, second in 6 minutes and 20 seconds, third in 4 minutes and 45 seconds, etc. And we need to convert that time to seconds. So how are we going to do that? We're going to take the number of minutes times 60 plus the number of seconds. That will give us a total number of seconds for the pre-test. I have the same information for the post-tests. First person, 5 minutes, 16 seconds. So we're going to convert all of the pre-tests and post-test scores from minutes and seconds to seconds, and then we're going to look at their differences to see whether or not people improved, and they will improve if their times go down. So you'll notice I have the data in Minitab. I have column 1 called pre-minutes, column 2 called pre-seconds. We want to get our pre-data, so we're going to say let C3, actually we'll say array C3 first, array C3. Then I'm going to say let C3 equal 60 times C1 plus C2. What will that give us? That will give us 330. 60 times 5, 300 seconds, plus 30 seconds, 330. Uh, 6 times 60 is 360, plus 20 is 380, etc. And we're going to call that column the pre-column. And we're going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to say let C7 equal, let C7 equal 60 times C5 plus C6. 60 times C5 plus C6. And what do we get there? 60 times 5 is 300 plus 15, 315, and we're going to call that post. And I want one more column I'm going to call diffs. And what do I want to do with those? I'm going to say let C9 equal the post test C7 minus the pretest C3. C7 minus C3, that'll give me my differences. So you'll notice the first guy had a post of 315 and a pre of 330, so his diff should be negative 15, is it? Indeed it is. So I have 10 differences here that I can look at. Now I need to check to make sure that those differences come from a normal population. So I'm going to say norm test C9. Norm test C9. And what's going to come back? Notice we're going to get a mean of negative 12.2, a standard deviation of 13.1, and a p-value of 0 0.509. If the p-value is small, we reject normality and we reject the t-test. We have to do something else. But the p-value is large, so it is reasonable for us to assume that this set of differences could have come from a normally distributed population. So again, here are our results. And it's nice that it gives us x bar s and n that we can use in our computation. So again, there's our x bar, our s, and our n. And we want to determine whether or not we can say that performance improved. If performance improved, post-test minus pre-test would have to be negative. You'll notice x bar is negative. On average, these people took 12 seconds off of their mile time. So again, we want the mean difference to be less than 0. So our HA this time, the mean of the differences will be less than 0 versus our H0 always has an equal sign in it, mu sub d equals 0. So here's all our information, mu sub d equals 0 versus mu sub d is less than 0. There's our test statistic N, X bar, and S. 
t is x bar minus mu divided by s over root n. t is x bar, negative 12.2, minus mu, minus 0, divided by s, 13.1 over root n over root 10. And the result I get here is negative 2.945. So that is my test statistic. That is a large negative test statistic. I feel much better about this one than the previous problem. My HA is mu sub D is less than 0, so I have to shade to the left of negative 2.945. So here's our information. You'll notice that DF is N minus 1. DF is 10 minus 1, or 9 degrees of freedom. We are shading to the left, so we ask many tabs CDF, negative 2.945, semicolon T9. And what does that give me? That gives me a very, very small probability of 0 0.008. So there's our T9. There's our negative 2.945 with 0 0.008 in the tail. So 0 0.0082 will indeed be my p-value, very, very small p-value. So now we have to either reject H0 or fail to reject H0. The p-value is small. just quickly corrected a typo. The p-value is small, so we must reject H0. So in this case, we have sufficient evidence to conclude that students improved their time in the mile after participating in the training. Okay, one more quick example. We have several people enrolled in a career improvement class. They stated their salaries at the start of the class, and they stated their salaries a year after the class, and the question is, did the salaries improve? So again, a person with a high salary at the beginning will likely have a high salary at the end, so we're dealing with dependent samples. H0 mu sub d equals 0 versus HA mu sub d is greater than 0. So I'll show you the data. So before 30,000, after 35,000, that person improved 5,000. Here before 25,000, after 50,000, that person improved 25,000. Dramatic improvement. Was it due to the course or to something else? Maybe a change in the economy. This poor guy went down 10,000, so what does this tell us? Could we say that this was effective? But before we do anything else, we have a small number of differences, and we must check to see if those small number of differences could have come from a normal distribution. So do they? We're going to do the norm test on any tab, and what result do we get? The result that we get here is P is 0.012. That is a small P value. We'll use 0.05 to define small. So if the p-value is small, we reject normality, and we're not confident using the paired t-test here because the underlying data set that the differences came from may not have been normal. Therefore, it's not fair to use the one uh, sample paired t-test. And that will conclude this presentation.